desolate everything is here in the dear cottage, now that all our furniture is removed to our new home. It is a small cottage, but it was quite large enough for William and I when we first came here eight years ago. From the beginning, I had only one objection to it, and that was that it was rather too close to the road. This is a small cottage, and from the manner in which it is built, noises pass from one side of the house to the other. If we have visitors, I observed to William, a sick person could not be in quietness. But I did not know then how very noisy the dear cottage could become. There is a small house at Grasmere Empty. That is what William wrote in his letter to me. It was the first I ever heard of this place that was to become my home. He had walked past it on a walking tour with dear Coleridge and our brother John. Perhaps we shall take it, he wrote to me, and purchase furniture. It was six o'clock on the evening before the shortest day when William and I arrived here in Town End. Six o'clock and dark. Our neighbour Molly Fisher was here to welcome us with a small fire. Just a handful of cinders in a miserable dark chimney. And poor Molly never forgets that day. Every 20th of December at six o'clock she comes in a brisk way to shake my hand. She even remembers how I was dressed when we arrived. I said the poor creature, and will never forget to lull striped gown and to lull straw bonnet as you stood here. This cottage has often been crammed edge full with visitors. In the first year, Mary Hutchinson stayed with us for five weeks and all of Coleridge's family were here for nearly a month. And dearest John, our departed brother, was often with us in the first year. The image of him haunts me with many a pang in the midst of a happy recollection. So many kind and excellent friends have walked in through that door. I believe that foremost amongst the blessings of the last eight years have been the pleasures and consolations of friendship. I remember Coleridge coming often after he and his family settled at Keswick. I remember how William and I listened with increasing pleasure as he read his Christabel to us by the fire. And just last year, Mr De Quincey came to visit us for the first time full of gratitude and veneration for the pleasure that lyrical ballads had given him. Such a remarkable instance of the power of my brother's poems. Oh, I remember one morning while we were at breakfast, William and I were talking about the pleasure we always feel at the sight of a butterfly. I told him I used to chase them a little, but was afraid of brushing the dust off their wings, so I did not catch them. And he told me how when they went to school they used to kill the white ones because they were Frenchmen. And so he wrote a poem to a butterfly. He sat there with his bowl of broth before him and his little plate of bread and butter and ate not a morsel until he'd finished. Nor put on his stockings but sat there with his shirt neck unbuttoned and his waistcoat open while he did it. Oh pleasant. Pleasant were the days, the time when in our childish plays my sister Emmeline and I together chased the butterfly. A very hunter did I rush upon the prey. With leaps and springs I followed on from brake to bush. But she, God love her, feared to brush the dust from off its wings. I have written about everything in my journal, beggars and butterflies and daffodils and even that old fellow we saw once gathering leeches. But I am not capable of writing anything that might give pleasure to others besides my own particular friends. I have no command of language, no power of expressing my ideas and no one was ever more inapt at moulding words into regular metre. I have often tried, when I have been walking alone, muttering to myself, as is my brother's custom, to express my feelings in verse. Feelings and ideas such as they were, I have never wanted. But prose and rhyme and blank verse were jumbled together and nothing ever came of it. Yet dear William has turned my memories into poetry. She gave me eyes, she gave me ears. That is what he has said of me. We spent sweet times in this room. 
William reading Johnson, perhaps, whilst Dad studied German. Just the fire fluttering and the watch ticking as we read. And I would hear nothing save the breathing of my beloved. And every now and then he'd push his book forward and turn a leaf. But William's marriage brought changes. Though I was very happy that he should marry, for there never on earth lived a finer woman than dear Mary. From the very beginning, I had not a doubt but that she was formed to make an excellent wife to my brother. I had long loved her as a sister, and she was equally attached to me. This thing so, I looked forward with perfect happiness to this connection between us. But I half dreaded the concentration of tender feelings, past, present and future, that I knew would come upon me on the wedding morning. They were married on the 4th of October 1802 at Gallow Hill in Yorkshire, where Mary had lived with her brothers and sisters. Such a day. I was indeed overcome by tender feelings on the morning of the wedding, and found myself quite unable to accompany dear William and dear Mary to the church. William parted from me upstairs. I gave him the wedding ring, with how deep a blessing. I took the ring from my forefinger where I had worn it the whole of the night before. He slipped it again onto my finger and blessed me fervently. When they were absent at the church, I kept myself as quiet as I could. But when I saw the two men running up the walk coming to tell us it was over, I could stand it no longer and threw myself on the bed. I lay there in stillness, neither hearing nor seeing anything. I wished only for everything to be over and that we might be at home again. But it was a great joy to come home to our little cottage after the wedding and to welcome Mary as a sister. And very soon there were other new faces by our fireside. We have three dear children now and I feel deeply every hour the blessings which God has given us. What peace and pleasure, wakefulness and hope there is in attending healthy infants. One's thoughts are never tired when so employed. But now Mary is with child once more, and the dear cottage has become a great deal too small for our family. We have the children continually out of doors if the weather is fine, so there is quiet for those within. But in bad weather, when the children cannot go outdoors, their noise is heard in every corner of the house. In milder seasons, my brother will compose his verses in the open air. But last winter was long and severe, and he was obliged to labour in the room common to all the family, with the children frequently playing alongside him. I must confess, we are never thoroughly comfortable until after seven o'clock in the evening when all the children have been put to bed. Dear William must have peace in which to work, for I have no thoughts more soothing than that my dear brother may perform great things for the benefit not only for the people of this time, but also for those that come after us. We must of course have a larger home, but the dear cottage, I will talk of it no more, for it makes me feel quite sad. Eight years we have spent at Grasmere, and I think these years have been the happiest of my life. <laughs>